That's going to yeah. be our click. That's going to be our clickbait title. Microsoft is shutting down Excel. Yeah. Oh my thousands god, thousands of amazing. hits. That's great. <laughs> Hey, Ulrika, how's it going? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. Do you have good. a good weekend? Yeah. Out with the kids, having fun in the sun. What about you? Oh, it, yeah, awesome. We had, considering we had an ice storm the week before, and then this week it was like in the 20s, like Celsius. So I was out doing yard work, cleaning stuff up, changing tires, taking lights down, getting all ready for spring, and yeah, I got a bit of a sunburn. So that was the walk, point I was walk, trying to make. Good. Yeah. <laughs> walk, walk, yes. <laughs> welcome to Canada. All right. Okay. Um, so welcome to the Power Platform uh, Boost podcast, everyone. Uh, this is your timely source of Power Platform news and updates with your host, that's me, Ulrika Kebek, and Nick Dolman. And this week, we don't really have a pick of the weekly as we've uh, had the previous episodes, uh, but we do have a lot of topics to talk about, a lot of things we want to deep dive into and cover. Um, and to start things off, we are going to talk about developer environment deletion. What? So, I know, right? So big I news. love developer environments. <laughs> yeah. I've been using them all the time. Exactly. And that's the point. Do you use yours all the time? Then there's nothing to worry about. But if we backtrack a couple of months, uh, Microsoft released the news that you were now allowed to have three in developer environments, which is great. So now each and every one of us can have three complete environments where we can play and test and develop. Uh, no cost, uh, no strings attached, no license requirements. Now, however, they see that, of course, it is um, using Azure credits. It's taking up a lot of space and a lot of um, performance, of course, uh, on Microsoft's side. So, and there's a lot of developer environments that are not in use all the time. So there's low activity. And those environments will now be deleted. So I think so. there's three criteria that you need to, um, to look out for. There's user activity. So if you launch an app, you execute a flow, or you use a chat, or something like that, then that is activity. Um, there is maker activity. If you create a new app or read or update or delete on an app or a flow or uh, a bot or a custom connector, for instance, that is activity. And there's admin activity. So environment operations, copy, delete, backup, recovery, reset, those types of things will also you know, be triggered. That's also activity. So if you make sure that you have activity every, is it every month? Did I read that correctly? Um, it could be. I mean, or it'd be at some time thing, right? I think it's, yeah, that sounds, I think that sounds correct. Yeah. So what we're doing right now is browsing through. So Aziram Ninja or EY Coleman, he did a blog post about this. Um, actually, it was kind of a funny thing. I haven't seen clickbait as much in our line of work, right? So with, with uh, blog posts and everything. But he had a real one, a real cool um post out there on social media, really clickbaity. Uh, you're going to lose your development and it's going to be deleted <laughs> kind of thing. I love that. Uh, it made me read his blog post. Uh, good job, EY. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's good. It's it's sort of like when you have your, uh, you keep moving your mouse so your screen doesn't go to sleep or something like that. <laughs> something like that. But it's, and I mean, yeah, in terms of developer environments, like in case you missed that news, that was, yeah, that was a few months ago, and you get, you get three. Now, you said no strings attached. There, I mean, there are, obviously, you can't use this for production environments, and and there's a two gigabyte limit. But in terms of building building your applications and testing and trying like new stuff out, there it, it, is, it is something we've been asking for, and especially like if you're working on multiple projects, uh, it's, it's it's better to have more than just one developer environment. You could have one before, but now, you know, you could have one dedicated to a project or, or and then different people can have their own developer environment. So getting closer to that, 
I guess you call it ALM utopia, <laughs> where every developer has their own environments and then they're up, they're refreshed from like a, you know, a main environment or source control. But yeah, it's good to know that they're going to, I, you know, big, big shout out to EY for, for calling us out and drawing attention to this because I, I think I saw maybe a couple other things, but that's something that could easily slip by someone's radar. You're working on mm. your life's work, your super duper power app <laughs> or your, your pages yeah. site or whatever. And then you get, as we all do get pulled away in other projects and you go back three months later and then it's gone. Um, yeah. And to that point as well, he does specify that in the blog post, Microsoft states that an environment is considered to be inactive when it's been uh, not used for 90 days. At that point, it is disabled. And then if there's no activity for the next 30 days, then it will automatically be deleted. So first you have 90 days of inactivity, which make the environment deactivated or disabled. And then you have another 30 days. And I expect there to be a lot of emails and a lot of warnings. They wouldn't just delete it. You would get some warnings in advance. So if you didn't pay attention, then of course it will be deleted. But this also speaks to the fact that you know, Microsoft, this is costing Microsoft a lot of money. This is something that they actually provision for us or um, capabilities that they give out uh, to us. And then it's our responsibility to, to use it or delete it if we don't use it. Absolutely. Yep. And I think, um, yeah, cool. And then, yeah, so I was uh, looking around too, and something that also is now rolling out in public preview, um, and I'm not sure, have you in your project, Sodreka, do you set up a lot of security in Dataverse? Is that something you do? Uh, no, I stay clear it as much as I can, actually. <laughs> no, I have very, very limited experience in the security uh, editor. And from my experience, the, the the user experience and the setup of it is also on the old experience, isn't it? So it's everything yeah, got the, modernized but that. And when we talk about old experience, we're going back to like CRM 4 2011 era of filling it in. And then the the legacy of what we now I would call the legacy um, Dataverse security role editor, which is effectively the exact same thing as the Dynamics 365 or the old CRM security role editor. Um, it, you know, you'd have your list of all your 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 tables, but then it would be kind of divided up by tabs, more like in sales and service, which of course align to CRM, but don't really align well to maybe your own custom Power App environment, what you're doing. And then when you scrolled, like when you scroll down to see the different permissions, you would lose your headings. And I found that so weird considering... When we look at views, the headings stay put. So you're not sure, okay, am I updating the right permission or the read permission? And then even to do that. Whole, can I just stop you right there? So the, the experience yep. that we're talking about, is it the big table with all the colored dots? And yes. where you get the quarter and it's orange and then you get a half and then it's green. And it's, is that the one? Yep. All right. That's okay, thank you. Just yep. needed to know that we're on the same kind of experience because that experience. We're on this. Oh, yeah, we're no on the same page, clear. literally. Right. It, yeah, <laughs> literally on the, the same page. page. Exactly. So people listening also know what we're talking about. It's a great matrix of yes. that yeah, experience, right? Those those dots. And it's kind of like filling in like um, you know, those I'm not sure if, if you had those those types of tests in, in school or stuff where you had to fill in, you know, answer one, two or three and fill in the little dots. And then it's very similar to this and you, to go through the different security permissions, whether it's business unit or organization or user, you'd have to click, but you have to keep clicking through and cycle. Now you could do this on a row or a column basis, um, but it's, it's very clunky. And then with custom and of course, custom entities, of course, originally where Dataverse came from, you know, we could add custom entities as a way to extend CRM. Well, of course, this is all now Dataverse is where you create your own custom tables so that particular tab to fix this, make the security for that, you got to scroll through potentially hundreds and on even some projects, you know, up towards thousands of custom entities or custom tables, that becomes very, very clunky and very hard to do. And there's no so, search and no sorting and no views no. or nothing. Hmm. Sounds no, like something needs to be updated. Hmm. Absolutely. So finally, well, f you know, finally now we have a new, a new experience. Now it is public preview, but however, it's kind of one of those weird public preview things where 
it actually you you can actually it's available in all your environments and you have the ability to go back to the legacy editor if you do run into something or for some crazy reason you prefer it i'm not sure why now not to say that the new experience is is 100 there like it definitely has a lot of great things um you know, you can show all the tables for a particular security role or just the ones that have been assigned or unassigned. So if someone says, hey, I have the, you know, the the member manager custom security role, but how come I don't have access to the membership payments? Then you could actually see, oh, membership payments is an unassigned table. And you can quickly identify that. The tables are grouped, not by tabs, but kind of like a table grouping, which I think helps a little bit. And you can also search for a table or search for a privilege. So it's like, okay, I need to find the account table or need to find some other table. You can type it in the search box. Or if you need to find a particular privilege, I need to find the published, the ability to publish reports, for example. I can type in publish and I'll get those particular privileges. I can find those. Um, In terms of it doesn't have that row or column selection, but what you can do is you can copy table permissions. So if you set up your 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 table permissions for one particular, let's say you set the account. I want this, you know, to be able to read, uh, write, but not delete and whatever. And then what I can do is I can select that table that I can copy and then I can pick a whole bunch of tables in my list. And then that will copy those exact same privileges to those tables. So that That must be a big time saver. And then there's also some templates, um, the ability there's like, so you can just assign these pre-built templates. There's no access, full access, collaborative or collaborate, uh, private reference. And then of course you create your own custom. Now you can't create multiple custom templates yet. I think that might've been a request or might be on the roadmap, but at least it's a step in the right direction. Um, and, but yeah, overall it is a huge improvement I, I will admit it's probably not 100% perfect, but then again, I think editing permissions on any system is is going to be tedious. It's going to be one of these very important tasks that need to be done, but hopefully this tool takes everybody in the step in the right direction. So, um, And it's rolling out. So I know it's on the Canadian tenants and it should be completely rolled out everywhere by uh, April 25th. So if you don't see it yet, be patient. It will show up in your environment real soon. Right. Looking forward to that. And that is something that is, oh, it's mind boggling. If you, if you want to write that up in a, in a matrix kind of, or in a spreadsheet or wherever you want, it's going to be complex either way. So it's, it's, it's some of the, one of the things that are really hard to wrap your head around when you get started with it and also creating a good user experience on top of something like that, of course, is very challenging. And this is also something that is one of the, most important selling points of the platform as well because that is something that we're asked of course anytime we go into a new product or into a new customer what is the security model how how fine can you refine the security model how many how can that matrix look how how advanced can it be and of course the answer is well down to the last letter of <laughs> almost um and of course something as advanced and as deep and complex as that it's of course also making it as advanced a user interface to work with so um very excited to see if they've simplified it somewhat uh, to make it more accessible low code friendly but then again something as important and as advanced as security needs to be it can be allowed to be more of an advanced user interface as well because you would have to know what you're doing in order to set it up in the first place or you should know what you're doing um yeah it's very keen to see the balance that they're, they're putting this on is it very local friendly is it supposed to be very intuitive or is it meant to be a little harder to get it do you know what i'm talking the balance the level yeah i think obviously you want to make it accessible. Now, what's interesting is this, it's it's only available through the Power Platform Admin Center, which of course leads people to think this is a more of an admin type role, but I think it's also the maker's responsibility to consider security, especially in applications like, you know, finance or HR especially, right? Like um a lot of people do not necessarily want, you know, things like their personal information or salary information to be accessible by everybody. So you really have to to take care when doing that. So 
uh, yeah, like we want to make it, I think, easy to set up the security, but still make sure the security is robust so it can't be <laughs> hacked, I guess the best way to of put course. it, right? Um, and then, you know, and there's other, you know, and just a quick segue on, like a quick start segue, a little uh, a quick reminder if for anybody who has to troubleshoot troubleshoot security issues, it's not necessarily related to this, but there is um, the tools, the the um, the Dataverse um, add-in for I think Chrome. It also works on Edge as well. There's the add-ins. It's the level up. <laughs> the, the, oh, the God mode. Oh, yeah, it, took it has... still, oh, it took me five years as a, a dynamics consultant before I, I dared to use that tool. Ah, oh, you can do so much damage. I'm well, terrified. true. There is there is the God mode, and I mean, I think probably that would be a topic that we should talk about in the future about God mode and the and should that be allowed and should that be locked down. But what I was more referring to in that level up tool, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. There's something called impersonate. So, and I've used this tons of times to save, you know, save me a ton of time, you get a user coming up and they say, Hey, I can't in the, in this app you built, I can't access X, Y, Z. So you go and like, and of course your system administrator, you go, well, it works for me. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you? And it's like, Oh, probably a security thing. So what a lot of people have had to do over the years, it's like, okay, I need to set up a user that has the same security roles in the same business units as this user that's running into problems to test. And that can be pretty tedious. What's cool about this impersonate tool is you can launch it and you can pick the particular user. So if Sally says, hey, I'm, I can't access X, Y, Z, you can launch level up as a system administrator and then you could pick Sally's name. And then, then you're working in your model-driven app as Sally. And then you can click and follow the same step she's doing and see, ah, you don't have access to this particular table or you don't have access to this particular field or something like that. And then you can kind of go in and fine tune those security roles to fit that. So that in case anybody that's just a kind of mm -hmm. throwing that in as a tip, if you're working with security roles, check out the level up tool that could save you literally hours in terms of troubleshooting security issues. And of course, working in Dynamics uh, project as well, it saved me so much time and, and in testing when you're using test data and you're deleting that thing or setting a record or to a row to disabled or wherever you do and then you want to reverse it you want to test it again as a tester i find the tool very handy because you can and that is god mode isn't it right because you can abide by all the rules no rules you can do whatever you want you can whatever field is even if it's um, disabled you can go in and you can change the um, the value of it so yeah. In terms of testing, oh, yeah. it's a really good tool. Is it a Microsoft yeah. tool or is it a community tool? Oh, that is a community tool. That's uh, Natraj out of, I think he's in Australia. Um, he wrote that. And, um, but at the end of the day, he, they, they're not doing any hacking. They're, they're using the, the DOM object model. So nothing is being broken from Microsoft in terms of this tool. It's using all the available APIs and things that are available. Um, but at the end of the day, if you know if a user doesn't have access to a particular field even though they can go in and maybe even launch this god mode if your security is set up correctly you still can't um you know the user still should be blocked out of that so again with everything you need to be careful but yeah it's a uh, and it, it's got like a whole whack of other things like showing yeah. required fields and showing uh pick list names and for development it's it's a, it's a lifesaver. I think I probably have it anytime I was doing development, I had it open all the time. Yeah, I don't know. And we'll make sure we'll make sure to put links to it in the show notes as well. Cause it was a tool that should be used with caution, but if you know what you're doing, of course, then it's really helpful. Um, another thing that I wanted to, to mention is uh, we talked about um, enterprise worthiness <laughs> as a topic. Yes. I just wanted to touch on it a little bit because I uh, listened to the uh, Low Code Approach, a uh, podcast that we've mentioned a couple of times. One of their older episodes is about data-driven application design. It's with Ren and Hancock. And they touch on something that I think is really, it really resonated with me because that's something I've had to do uh, the, the last couple of years that is really new to me as well. Being with Dynamics and, and, and Dataverse, being an, a product over 30 years old, right? And we've had 
enterprise where the application is built on it, it it's um, it's a high density kind of tool. And all of a sudden, the couple of the last couple of years, we've had to convince customers and that it's an enterprise worthy product. And it's only in the recent years. I think that's the point that Brennan makes in the episode as well. It's only in the recent years that we've seen the simple application being built on Dynamics 365 platform. Um, so I just wanted to mention that episode as well. It's a really good episode. It talks to those uh, with a historic perspective as well on the platform that we're in. And you've been with the product for um, from the beginning, Nick. Do you have any thoughts on... Do you have to make those arguments to customers these days that, of course, not when you're in Microsoft, but before you join Microsoft as well, that it is enterprise worthy? Do you have had do you have had this conversation? Oh, for sure. Um, and I think a lot of it it's it's two things. It's, it's interesting. One way I found customers always got very nervous when you started talking about custom because what does custom mean? Oh. That means someone is going to write you a specific piece of software. And I think every customer, a lot of customers I've talked to, they got really nervous about that because um, they've had situations in the past where they've had a software written for them, whether it was an access or visual basic or some other tool. And then when it became time to upgrade or make changes, the original developer was nowhere to be found. It's like, oh, well, the, we had this developer, but we can't locate him. He must have moved to like the backwoods of Alaska or something like that. So it's a case of, oh, here's here's something, here's Dynamics CRM or Dynamics 365 now, customer engagement, because a lot of these organizations, they need a CRM specific, you know, they have CRM core functionality, but a lot of the, you know, I've worked with government institutions and nonprofits and things like that. They're not doing traditional sales service marketing. So I made a pretty good career of building applications on top of dynamic CRM, which now people are doing every day as part of the power platform building. I would effectively say low code apps because a lot of these applications were really just creating custom entities using workflows, which are sort of a point and click type interface, there would be light, I would say low coding with like JavaScript. There'd be times where, yeah, you would have to write kind of more pro code using plugins and things like this. So in that respect, yeah, it was very well embraced, but it was interesting because from a perspective of someone within an organization, they're buying almost an off the shelf system. They're buying a CRM system And I'm helping them sort of tailor it or configure it or uh, personalize it to their own business using low code techniques that we use today when we're building power apps. And, And these are situations where these are enterprise, some of these are enterprise level customers using hundreds, maybe thousands of users. And then, and then you get, and I have been in the argument too, where yes, they, they need to build a brand new system and it's sort of like, oh, we're going to just customize an existing system. Well, wouldn't it be better if we wrote something from scratch? And then you'll have developers in the room that, you know, and yeah, they're very capable developers, but they want to kind of do everything. Where to me, it's like these tools provide the foundation. And and I'm always arguing saying, yes, as a developer, don't you want to be working on the fun, complicated (laughs) stuff and not, you know, not drawing user screens or, you know, user interfaces and that type of thing. But I could see the argument. I could see there being um, sort of the trepidation there. It's like, really, we have, we need this massive enterprise level system. And what you're going to do is you're going to use low code tools for that. So I wouldn't say low code does not mean low power. Um, Low code can be very high. Yeah. Or low complexity. complexity. Mm. Absolutely. Like I've seen very, like I've written, very complex power automate flows. Um, I've written, I find going into a canvas app and I'll be quite honest. I, anytime I go back into a canvas app, I almost have to relearn something. And I've heard the same experience by other people as well. And I probably feel more comfortable building something in visual studio code, like building a windows presentation application. Um, Just sort of how my brain works. So, yeah, I think, 
you know, there is this whole idea of this low code tools. It's not new. Dynamic CRM was out in 20, 2002. CRM version three was 2005. And at that time, I started building what I would call XRM applications. And these weren't like one offs for, you know, a single user. These were for teams to use to manage a lot of important data. Like I wouldn't call it life saving mission critical systems, but from a business aspect, very important information processing, you know, grant management, membership management, um, a whole bunch of different things like that. Even work for a a, a company for doing reinsurance um, evaluations where we had to, you know, at that time we had to hack the the currency because they couldn't handle the big dollars that they were handling. Right. So, um. Yeah, that's it, it. Is it enterprise worthy? Absolutely. It's been enterprise worthy for at least 15 years plus. Um, and all so of a it sudden, is, it's more of a marketing initiative, making it a low code tool. And all of a sudden, people think that it's not enterprise worthy anymore. But it's same, still the same underlying um, system and product. And that is what, you know, it weirds me out. I think it's very weird that we're having this conversation about something and it's the same thing underneath and all of a sudden it's a marketing strategy or marketing conversation actually diminishes some of the value that this product can, it brings to the market. And it's, it's weird as well because from, from one hand, we're having the discussion that it's, it's um, because it's low code, it's not low complexity. It's, it can handle both complexity and be low code at the same time. And it's different layer, layers of, how you build within the system so it's low code on top you have the you know the, the the low code tools that we use every day and then once you have that flow that you mentioned when, once that comes to a point where it's too complex you should switch and use logic apps instead and if logic apps is not good enough then you can write Azure functions it's the same kind of technology and it's very um Something you can, you know, based on if you're a developer, pro coder, or low coder, that's the different different uh, tools you would use for some of the same use cases, right? Um, but on the other hand, we have seen a lot of conversations in the community on social media the last couple of weeks as well about um, roles like power platform governance architects. So suddenly, there's a lot of new roles popping up when you have. Um, customers with multiple tenants talking tens and tens of tenants talking to each other. You have uh, tens and hundreds of environment talking to each other across borders, across countries with different um, currencies, as I talked about earlier. It's and, th and that is a very complex solution, and it's built on the same platform. And it's very strange to see those two different. So it's. Um, two ends of the spectrum and it's the same platform in the middle. It's very strange. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And that is the thing, right? You're, you're, there is people, they're building these applications and I know there's this whole thing to, you know, empower the citizen developers and, you know, citizen developers, oh, can they make, um, you know, can they make enterprise applications? And, Absolutely. But this is why we need those governance tools. You don't want that one person building an app and then have everything sort of underpinning on it. Um, this is where fusion teams come into play and um, planning on, you know, the right tools for the right job and the right people working on the right things. And as we know, with the power platform, there's always sometimes 10 different ways to do the same thing. And it's, you know, you need experience uh, building these applications to find the right mix of what's, you know, what's even what platform, like, you know, it drives me, I think I've mentioned this before, it drives me crazy when I hear someone say, well, what's better, a Canvas app or a model-driven app? It's like, yeah, it depends. It depends on what you're doing. And guess what? what? You, you can do? use both. You yeah, can use exactly. both. You no, can, and you I've can seen... write a... Yeah, I've seen Power BI reports that look like model-driven apps. And then yeah. they're confused because they can't do anything. And I'm like, yeah, you want sorting, filtering, searching, and you want to do stuff with data? I have another tool for you. It's, you know, it's it's the first page of the product specification. What is it for? Read that and then make your choice. And it's we've had to argue the same thing as well. When to use Power Apps or Canvas Apps, sorry, 
so this is when Power Apps Portals was a power app, right? So you had mm. Power Apps, Canvas app, well, driven app and portal, right? Now it's a separate product. It makes the, the marketing and the messaging easier. But we've both had that discussion. When do you use a Canvas app and when do you use a portal? And that's the same thing as well. So who's your user? Well, it's internal users. Well, then it's a Canvas app. Probably because of the licensing model at the time and other restrictions mm -hmm. as well. But I one of my most popular blog posts is the Canvas app versus Power Pages one, where you set up side by side. Canvas apps on one side, Power Pages on one side, and you 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 um see the difference and the similarities between the two. And that is crazy to me. That's the most important, one of the most popular blog posts. So it yeah. We have a way to go in terms of telling that story. And I love that you touched on Fusion Teams as well, because that is the solution in my mind. It's when you bring that low coder or the maker in and you mix it with the domain expertise that you have when you work at uh, a customer's or you work with your internal IT organization, you know the pain, you know the processes, you know the people, you know the legacy, the history, you know where you're going. And then you mix that with um, pro um, governance and ALM and, you know, development practices, best practices, and then you have adoption and then you have uh, user interfaces or user experience and design. There's so many levels and you bring those in and complete that team and you have that fusion team, they will learn from each other. And that's where, that's the magic of the Power Platform and low code in my mind. So when I work with customers that still to this day don't get that, it's, not React or Power Pages. It's not pro code or low code. It's together. It's in the same team working on the same problem. And it's like you touched on just a couple of minutes ago. As a developer, as a pro coder today, do you want to sit, work eight hours a day creating forms and lists that you can search and filter? No, you want to solve the difficult problems, the things that haven't been solved already. Portals, forms, lists. We've solved it. The, the problem is solved. We know how to, how to do it. Don't, as a pro developer, sp do, spend your time, do the complex, solve the complex problems. Well, or, or that's, what we talk about. <laughs> no, this is, this is, this is all good. And then you talk about another thing about as a pro developer, do you want to spend your time building a security model for your custom application? Exactly. Um, that is or probably the most authentication, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Like those are the types of things that I think, you know, <laughs> drive could drive me as a developer would drive me nuts. Um, and this yeah. is why these, these low code tools and working together is great. And then we talk about, you know, the argument, well, you know, is it enterprise worthy? I can tell you what's not enterprise worthy, having your entire enterprise underpinned by an Excel worksheet with, tons of data and worksheets. And I've seen that multiple times because, you know, Excel is great, <clears throat> low barrier to entry, but I've seen situations where um, <laughs> they have have like um, their entire business is reliant on this particular spreadsheet owned by one person, kind of very protective, do not touch my spreadsheet. Or you do have multiple people on that spreadsheet and they're like, wait a minute, a whole bunch of data just went missing. Where did it go? Who did it? Yeah. Or even the entire sheet's gone missing. I've seen that as well. It's sort of like, and I've been brought into meetings where, okay, well, we had this, you know, whole uh, grant management application system in a spreadsheet and um, yeah, we kind of lost it. So can you help yeah. us out here? And, and this is where Power Platform kind of comes in and saves the day. So yeah, is it enterprise yeah. worthy? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I've also heard that the biggest challenge if Microsoft wanted to explode Power Platform even more than it has exploded, just turn off Excel. That's the, <laughs> you know, so I, um, the, the, the biggest competitor to Netflix is our sleep. The biggest competitor to Power Platform is Excel. That's crazy, but it's true. So many core, and that is exactly to the point that we're trying to make. If you wonder if Power Platform is enterprise level have enterprise level capabilities, if you're relying on Excel today, then the answer is yes. 
<laughs> Absolutely. That's going to yeah. be our click. That's going to be our clickbait title. Microsoft is shutting down Excel. Yeah. Oh my thousands God, that's of amazing. hits. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no that's so true and then i wanted to shout out as well to my dear friend thomas Hanser. he made a great um, blog post uh based on some posts that he did the um a, a week or two ago that he actually asked so if is javascript a pro code or low coder should a functional consultant know how to do javascript and it's a really interesting conversation as well i'm I'm not a trained developer. I don't know React or any, I'm not full stack. I'm just a front end learning by doing. Um, so for me, but I know JavaScript and I know in Power Pages, for instance, if you want to show height fields or if you want to validate fields on a form, it's a JavaScript snippet, right? So that's for us, it's not customization. It's a part of the product. And as anyone, I think, you know, can go on um, Stack Overflow and now you can ask chat to be to, uh, create a small small JavaScript snippet for you. You can paste it in there, and it's working. But is it? So, what is your take? Do you think JavaScript is it low code or pro code from a Dynamics perspective? Good question. I would say it is JavaScript. I would say is a pro coding language, but I also would say it's very accessible to functional consultants. And I believe, in my mind. A functional consultant, they don't have to be a hardcore JavaScript developer, but I think to understand, like even scripting languages in general, like JavaScript, um, probably a few others, um, back in the day, VBScript and those types of things, they're not hard concepts and they could solve a lot of problems very quickly. Now, the nice thing within Dataverse and model-driven apps, we have business process flows and um, we can do flow. So the need for JavaScript is, I think, is reduced over the last few years. But that being said, there are still some cases where JavaScript can come in handy. And you're right when you said chat GTP, of course, um, GitHub Copilot can also generate code for you. And there's other tools as well. Um, the like Dataverse REST Builder is one um uh, there's a, a, a Guido Guido's tool. That's another one I like to use a lot, not just for Power Pages, but for other dataverse type as well and that's not to say that um, a functional consultant couldn't use those tools and i know functional consultants they they may say we can't write code but we can read it we can understand it and that's then me. we can that, there yeah. you go yeah i can put so, it together right yeah and, and at the end of the day and, and here's a secret i know pro developers out there are probably going to be screaming at me what 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 is the true um f- uh job of a developer it's cut and paste you either <laughs> cut and paste from your We're last project to oh okay We're supposed to we'll, we'll maybe edit that out we'll see um yeah. but yeah it's no. it's you know i would say yes it javascript yeah pro language but it is low code accessible absolutely and and then um back to thomas's blog post he makes the the um comparison between javascript and power effects writing expressions in in canvas apps as well and i know that you already mentioned that as well once you for me it's the same thing every time i'm doing a project with canvas apps i feel like i have to start to learn it again and i know that it's because the as thomas mentions as well the way you write the code logically it's reversed so if you would in javascript you would write what you want the system to do in in canvas app you would start with the solution that you wanted to to make or the result that you want to have. And that, in my mind, struggle to um, switch gears and reverse that my, that way of thinking, I always go at it the JavaScript way and I always get kicked the, in the butt for it, right? So, I, and it always gives me errors. And that is probably, I, I often use a chat GP for that more than for JavaScript, actually, because that is the thing that I'm struggling with the most. Yeah, and I and I struggle with that too because I don't write Canvas apps a lot. And then when I first do it, it's like, oh, I need to. In my mind, this is backwards. It's more pushing than pulling, I guess. Is exactly. The best way to describe. Exa- yeah, that's right, and that's the thing I'm struggling with as well. So yeah. Okay, I like this. There's uh, so many uh, great resources that, of course, we'll put uh, links to, links to in the show notes. 
Um, and uh, we're running short on time, but we wanted to talk about, uh, so the last thing on our list is to talk about the upcoming events. Because we've, uh, you've collected a list of events, Nick, that we see are all falling on the same two days, two to two, yeah. three days in May. So, so it's funny because we went for two or three years with no events to almost event every weekend now, which is awesome. I love it. Um, the in person, like, sorry, I mean, in person events. I think I think we're all a little <laughs> tired of some of the virtual events. Now, there are two that are coming up before, like, so there's a bunch this year, but I'm only focusing on the first next month or so. Um, Iberian Summit, which is next week, April 28th and 29th, in uh, Alahayo, and it has a little umlaut on the. I'm English, so I can't, I'm an English speaker, I can't figure these out. A lot, that's in Portugal. Um, so I, it's IberianTechSummit.com. I know there was a few issues with the website, but I think that's all sorted out now. So check that out. I am still planning on teaching a course there. Um, and then there's in Las Vegas, there's the M365 conference, which is, I guess, more teams office, but does have power platform components. That's in May 2nd to 4th. Now, then we have four events that are literally happening on the same three days. And so in terms of um, choosing, if you have to choose to go to which one, I'm, I can't tell you exactly which one to go to. Um, I'm not going to any of them, unfortunately. I think, Ulrika, you're not going to any of these either, right? Yeah. No, it's but, my birthday on the 24th, so I have to stay home. Oh, th I'll thanks. Use yeah. I, I knew that already. So if that's your way of telling me, I'm already aware. <laughs> May 2-4. That's Queen Victoria's birthday, by the way. Oh, right. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, anyways, British uh, British colony here. So yeah, I know, I know, I know. We, we have a holiday. <laughs> I love that you're teaching me. Yeah, no, great. Go on. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we're, right, well, we're going to write. This is going to be one of those longer episodes again. European Col Collaboration <laughs> Summit. That's in Düsseldorf in Germany. That's May 22nd and 24th. I think that's a lot more of a, that's also like an M365 kind of focused teams, um, power platform in general, that kind of thing, SharePoint. Also May 22nd, 24th in Portoraz, Portoraz Slovenia is Dynamics Mind. Now this is a focus on power platform, but also the Dynamics products like FNO, Business Central. And what I like about their website, they have this whole wizard theme going. All the speakers are, you know, they're wizards or witches or, you know, different things like that. It's really creative and really cool. And I'm kind of, in a way, I'm kind of kicking myself because I'm actually traveling through Europe at that time. And <gasps> I, should have, I should have done a detour. Do you like to dress up? Do you, like to, do you have a costume? You could go in there like a big wizard. Uh, let's, let's, let's move that for another conversation for another day. <laughs> No, but Slovenia, isn't that, uh, that, that is Dracula and uh, Van Helsing and all that, isn't it? Or am I totally yeah. off of that? Yeah. Oh, that's so oh, cool. Oh, yeah. So it, that looks really interesting. A lot of big names there. And then if you're more in the North American part of the world, like, like I am, but, um, Dynamics Con Live, and that's happening from May 22nd to 25th. That's in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I know the folks at Dynamics Con Live, they make it like a Comic Con type uh experience so i uh, we're all a bunch of nerds aren't we right we're all... yeah I guess, yeah true <laughs> and then and then on top of all of this microsoft build is happening now microsoft build covers the whole gamut from a developer's perspective from like azure and teams and and everything else but they also have some very interesting power platform um specific uh sessions there as well that revolve around the developers and if it's your birthday you. You know, if you want, there's better ways maybe to celebrate your birthday. I don't know. And uh, what could be better than going to a conference? So last year on my birthday, I was in a, I was in Iceland, and I had ten Icelandic businessmen singing my song to me on a in a cellar on a restaurant in Iceland. I think don't you, you never top that. No, that's yeah. <laughs> Happy, happy, happy birthday, this day is just for you. I wish you a happy birthday and a bunch of gifts or two. Cool. So, yeah, so check those out. And I think, yeah, we're going to be 
maxing out on time here. I hope everybody's okay with that. We're not, we're not three hours yet. We're under 40, 46 minutes, 47. Yeah. We swore to keep it under 30 minutes and we are not doing that any time soon. It's going to be 40 <laughs> minutes every time. <laughs> Probably. Well, thank you so much for listening anyways. If you're still here, thank you so much for listening to us rant and chat and having a good time. Thanks for listening to the Power Platform Boost podcast, your timely boost of news and information from the Power Platform, Microsoft, and of course, our great community with your hosts, Ulrika Akebeck and Nick Dolman. And join us again in two weeks on May the 3rd, 2023 for our next episode. And hey, you want to support us? Buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash powerplatboost. Uh, URL again is buymeacoffee.com slash powerplatboost. Thanks for listening and see you again in two weeks.